Good morning. Welcome to church. Come on, stand to your feet. Come on, sing this out. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night. The battle belongs to you. Hey! And if you are for me, who can be against me? Come on, say for Jesus. For Jesus says nothing impossible. Stand against the power of our God For you shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God The almighty fortress Lord, you go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God for you shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand it. Come on, lift your voice. He's an almighty fortress. Lord, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Stand against the power of our God. When I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you. With every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. This I 
thank you for breathing life into us in the midst of our darkness. You said you're not dead.
for boldness, for peace, for strength, for the wisdom to look up to you, God, for every decision. Jesus in a dark place, let me tell you what happens. Entire families come to know Jesus. Entire communities break out into revival. Entire states will come and bow at his feet. When we take Jesus into dark places, we don't just see amazing things happen. We flourish in the way that we were called to flourish as followers of Jesus. So half of you weren't looking at the screen just now when that video was happening because you didn't see what I saw. You know, there's a, in the Bible it talks about, Jesus tells this story about the shepherd that'll walk away from 99, 99 of his sheep to go after the one. Hold up, nope, too late now. <laughs> Listen, Wednesday night, 450 students, high school, junior high school students were in this room and I'm telling you, I was standing over here. I was back there for a little bit. I felt like I was supposed to go over in this corner. And I looked back across here, man, and they do things different, by the way. You, most of you wouldn't approve. They flooded this place. They were right there, and they were getting after it. And at the end of that message, in that time of worship, 67 didn't just like, I want to receive Jesus. No, they sent a text. They went out of their way and said, hey, I'm accepting the love of Jesus, the blood over my life. Help me walk this thing out. Sin, that's what they did. 67 of your children, of our children, of what some say the next generation, our youth staff, our volunteer staff, they said, no, it's the now generation. That's who said yes to Jesus Wednesday night. Listen, one more time for them and for every volunteer and staff person that gives of their time and their energy and their life to pour into that generation, get rowdy. Woo. Sorry, wasn't planning on doing that, but if we stop doing that, we might as well stop doing it all. You know what I'm saying? Because that's, that's where it's at. Welcome to church. <laughs> so glad that you're here online in the room. Listen, if this is your first time with us, uh, if you're online, there's a digital connect card. If you're in the room, do me a favor. Uh, don't worry about the card. Just stop by the connect center on your way out. It's kind of that season. Get a gift, get a high five. Uh, and again, if this is your first time, it's just our way of saying thank you so much for being with us. Uh, a couple things I want to hit super quick. Uh, we're going to wrap up our generation series today with Pastor Jerry Taylor in the house. 
Yeah, that's always exciting. And then next, it is. And then next week, we're going to kick off our Christmas series, Advent, that's going to take us right on into Christmas. Um, I know some of you were here last week, and you were like, man, we gave the Kingdom Builders offering. You've already caught me in the lobby and said, where did, where did we end up? Uh, I, I, everything in me wanted to tell you the number today. But let me tell you, it's actually gifts are still coming in. I'm going to make you wait one more week so we have a solid number. I'm, in, I'm encouraged. Uh, I think we're, I, I don't know if we're going to hit the goal next week, but we still got five more weeks. But anyway, we'll have a number. So get back in here next week to hear that. Two weeks, Merry Christmas, Gulf Coast. We, we're ready to... We're ready to have a shopping experience for 1,200 children, for so many different families. Hundreds of you have signed up to serve. Thank you for that. Many of you have procrastinated. Thank you for that, because it gives me this opportunity. We have two areas we need, we really need help. In two weeks, December the 4th, if you can speak Spanish, we need you, all right? You can stop by the toy tree in the square on your way out and say, hey, that's me, sign me up. Uh, another area we're doing something totally different in, instead of just like keeping kids while their parents shop, we're gonna actually do kids ministry. We're gonna share Jesus with them. We're gonna have fun. There's gonna be arts and crafts and games and all that stuff. If you will say, hey, Dale, on the 4th, I'm, I will come in here and I will minister to kids or dance with kids or have fun or play games with kids. If you'll help us in that area, you also stop by the toy tree on your way out and sign up. Everybody good? All right. Listen, what I'm about to show you, you I promise you, you don't want to miss it. All right. Really cool commercial for something very special this Christmas. Look at this. Are you ready to spend the Christmas season the way it was always intended to be spent? Together? We sure hope so. Join us on Sunday, December 19th for the biggest Christmas party of the season. You, your family, and all your friends are invited to this special afternoon where you can lace up your ice skates, sip some hot chocolate, grab a bite at any of the food trucks, sing along to some live Christmas music, enjoy the inflatables, and so much more. But perhaps the most important part is that we will all be gathered together, ready to experience City Hope's very first Christmas festival. During this season, we know that calendars fill up so fast, so do yourself a favor and save the date, let your friends know the plan, and get ready to make some special memories this Christmas season. City Hope. <clears throat> it's good to see you this weekend, and uh, it is. It's good to be in church with you. I, I got something I want to challenge you to do. Uh, you know, Thursday is Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. I received those four people who said Happy Thanksgiving back. <laughs> so the campus is Happy Thanksgiving to you, since I know you're saying it right back. But here's what I want you to do. You know, after you finish lunch or dinner, whatever you do with your family, you know, you're just kind of miserable for a little bit. <laughs> then you eat again. <laughs> Between the miserable and eat again, here's what I want you to do. At your table, with your family, I want you to bring up two topics. I want you to bring up Merry Christmas, Gulf Coast, and I want you to ask everybody at the table, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and then the next thing I want you to do before you go back for desserts the second time, I want you to talk about kingdom builders because we believe in building the kingdom of God and every family should be involved with that. Even your children, they should give toward that so that we reach the goal that we have set for this year. So how many of you will do that at Thanksgiving? Those of you who did not raise your hand, I believe you have, I pray you have indigestion all night long. 
Just saying. Malox will not work. Anyway, today we're finishing the series Generations with a message entitled, Fight to Finish. One of the ways the devil tries to get back at God is to destroy anything he loves. His hatred is so strong toward God that anything he can do to bring hurt to God, he will do. So the devil came up with this strategy to discredit God by damaging human beings. Now we may think his plan is violence, murder, terrorism, drug addiction, greed, but those are, strat strat those are not strategies, those are tactics. So a strategy incorporates the big picture. So the enemy today is moving with a strategy, a big picture right now. Well, what does that look like? Well, he's declared war on the family. The attack of the 21st century is on the family. And we have to understand the values that we cherish and the ideals we hold dear that they are worth fighting for. We have to take a stand for our homes, the marriages, our children, grandchildren, and the values that we have. So one of the best examples to show you families by the multitudes who are fighting for their homes is to look at a story that many of you are familiar with. It's in the book of Nehemiah. And I'm gonna read a couple of verses here. Uh, chapter four, verse 13. If you haven't read the story, you need to read it. It's a great story. Therefore, this is Nehemiah, I positioned men between the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So they are ready for battle. They are going to fight. I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your house. Then if you drop down to verse 20, here's what he says. Wherever you hear the sound, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. What the Bible's saying is if you fight for your family, God will fight for you. The Jewish people have been in captivity for 70 years. They've returned home, they find total destruction. The city's destroyed, the temple's destroyed, their homes are destroyed, their vineyards, their, their, their herds, their, their income, everything's destroyed. They started out by rebuilding the temple, they build the foundation, and after so many years, they left that project and they started building their own homes. This is when Nehemiah comes in. He comes in with a vision. His vision is to rebuild walls and gates of the city. The walls and the gates have been destroyed. Without walls, you have no protection. Without gates, you have no identity and you can't control what comes in and out of your city. So the vision was that he, he was going to organize people into, and, and leaders and families into units to rebuild the walls in front of their homes. Their vision was to rebuild the city. Now, if you take that, that represents today a type and a shadow of us rebuilding our life. It's like our life, this is the city. We need walls around it, we need to protect it. There's a battle coming. After a time, Nehemiah says, hey, we need everyone to you know, hold their hands up together, let's fight together, the battle's going on. He couldn't find anyone in the beginning because everyone's hands were fee feeble. They were overwhelmed because of what they saw. And, and they're thinking, look, everything's destroyed. We tried to build the temple back, that didn't work. And everything's destroyed, so what good is it for me to carry one stone or one beam? What good is that, one house, one family? So Nehemiah, get the picture, he's standing in the rubble of the ruins of the past of the people. They're overwhelmed, he released a strategy to rise and build. And this is why God sent Nehemiah. His name means consoling breath of God. He was the breath of God speaking to the people. He's a type of the Holy Spirit. So today, the Holy Spirit can see the outcome of what it will be like when you fight to finish what God has assigned to you and your house. I'm, I'm gonna say that again because I think you missed it. The Holy Spirit can see the outcome of what you have been assigned. You need to fight to finish because he has assigned something for your house to finish. So Nehemiah encountered opposition in rebuilding the walls. He had several enemies. And he said, he said to the enemies, he stood in front of them, he confronted them, and he said, these families do not belong to you our homes do not belong to you. Our marriages do not belong to you. The God of heaven will help us because we are committed to finish building our homes. 
to finish building our families. And then Nehemiah, with all the families, rebuild the walls, regardless of what the enemy had done or what he's gonna do in the future. They rebuilt the walls. Those, part of those walls are still standing today. In fact, right now, while we're speaking, they, there are probably people there praying at that wall today because God's people took a stand and said, I'm gonna fight for my family. That's how far this goes back. Our families are worth fighting for. It's not easy. It's never easy to hold your family together. It's not easy, especially in the day that we live. Everything seems to be against the family and the home. That's exactly how the Jewish people felt going back. It's devastating. Everything's destroyed our homes. Everything seems to be against our home. What can we accomplish? What can we build? But when we decide our family is a cause worth fighting for, then God said, I'll fight for you. If you'll fight for your family, I'll fight for you. Our enemy today is on a rampage. The bottom line, listen to me, the bottom line of what he's trying to do is to destroy the church. He can't destroy the church without destroying the home because the church is only as strong as the home. So if you take out the homes, you take out the families, then the church is not that strong. If attacking the home is the number one priority of the devil, then we need to make sure that protecting the home is the number one priority of our lives. The enemy wants to do everything he can to divide and conquer your family. But the Bible tells us, wait a minute, we are not ignorant of his devices and we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Not a type like Nehemiah, but we have the Holy Spirit and his power. It is a costly commitment. It will cost you something to hold your family safe. If you think about Noah, he made the commitment. It was a costly commitment to his family. He spent resources and energy and a lot of time building an ark, and people were laughing at him, mocking him. Society turned against him, but listen to what the Lord said to him in Genesis 7-1. He said, Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Just a, few, just a few verses before, God is, is lamenting that he even created man because man was so corrupt, but he found righteousness in this guy. After building the ark, before God closes the door to the ark, the Bible says that, that Noah was the eighth to go into the ark. Here's what that means. That means he's simply the last one. He's making sure that his family is in the ark before judgment comes down on the earth and so they can rise to their safety in this boat. So I'm saying to moms and dads and grandparents, fight to finish. Make sure that when the door closes, you know for sure that your family is safe in the ark. That, that, that's what we're called to do, moms and dad. Make sure that your kids know Jesus Christ because there is a second coming. There is, a, there is another ark that the doors are gonna close. There is gonna be a rapture. There is, there is an end to all of this and it's coming soon. You make sure, you fight for the finish that your kids, your family, your loved ones are in that boat. They're in the ark. And listen, don't leave it up to the church. I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor 60 years. And I know people depend on the church or the pastors or the children's pastor or the youth pastors to save your family. No, 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 no. Dads, and let me just step out here and make dads mad. Don't leave it up to mom to do all the praying. And all the women said amen. amen. The men didn't say a word. <laughs> dads, make sure your family's in the ark. And people will say, people will mock. Oh, you're building your house on spiritual principles? Well, that's old school, that's old fashioned. Aren't you in the 21st century? Well, listen, let me tell you what I've learned. The word works today. It's not old fashioned, it's not old school. It is living, it is alive, it's powerful. It's so powerful, it can pierce the division of the soul and the spirit. It can discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So what do we need to do? You need to know and remember, you need to say it in your spirit, God believes in families. God believes in my family. God believes in families. Now, we all have different kinds of families, and that's a good thing. We, we all have different kinds, but we should all have the DNA of the kingdom of God in our family. Here's the common thread our family should have. You see, there's two types of family. There's, there's, there's blood families and spirit families. So a blood family is people you share blood in common with. A spirit family is people you share God in common with. The goal of your family should be blood and spirit. 
You want your family not to just be people you know, of blood, but also a spirit you share God with because that's the closest bond you can have in your family. So families, you, 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 need to, you need to have that bonding, but you need to agree on two things to get the bonding. One is committed to God and be committed to your marriage. Because if you have any cracks in your commitment to God or your marriage, guess what? The enemy will move in and divide and conquer. So here's my purpose today. My purpose is to share with you four strategies to use in this battle. Here's strategy number one. Pray for our family and ask God to fight for us. Pray for our family and ask God to fight for us. We cannot let the world raise our children and we cannot let culture shape the bent in our children. Your children, grandchildren, have a God-given bent. It's the way he created them in the womb. That's why they're so valuable. They have this, this intuition, this design, this pattern, and they're supposed to accomplish something on this earth. You cannot let the culture shape that bent. I'll, I'll give you a, 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 down, a, a picture of this on the downside. There's, there's a guy, there's a man and a woman in the Old Testament, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. I'm sure you've heard of both of them. They were reckless in their lifestyle. They had idolatry, just everything you can imagine, and then some. They were control freaks. They were manipulators. They were corruption. They murdered people. They were sexually immoral. They were godless in all their ways. And the Bible said that they had a total of 70 children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And the Bible said when judgment came that an army invaded and cut off the heads of all the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, all 70 lives were blotted out. You say, well, that, that, that's horrible. Well, there, there's another side to this. There's another guy in the Bible, and, and, and he has 70 children, including grandchildren and great-grandchildren. His name is Obed-Edom. Well, who is he? Well, he's the guy, David's trying to get the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, back to Jerusalem. So he puts the Ark of the Covenant in Obed-Edom's house for three months. <laughs> Second Samuel 6 says, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Watch, he had 70 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And they were all affected by the presence of God in their house. Not one of them failed to worship in the temple. All 70 were serving in the temple. From bloodline to bloodline, the blessings flowed from generation to generation. Why? Because God's presence affected the family. There is something about the presence of God. If it gets into your kids, it gets into your teenager, they'll never be the same. Oh, they may become a prodigal for a season, but they know there's something about that. And today there's nothing more important than what we're doing right now is learning how to fight spiritually. And, and, and while I'm here, let, let me just go ahead and just meddle a little bit. You need to be aware of distractions that take you and your family away from the house of God at critical times. Yeah, but, yeah, but, well that's southern talk, that's not even Hebrew. <laughs> because your children need to be in children's church. Your children need to be in a youth group. They need to go to camp. They, you, you need to go on a mission trip. Don't, don't be distracted by things going on in the world because these are times your children need to be and encounter the presence of God. Don't give up when you're fighting for your family. Go to your prayer place, open the Bible, begin to declare the promises of God, and this is the promise God has for you today. You ready for this one? If you will fight to finish, God will fight for you. If you'll fight to finish God's plan for your house, he'll fight for you. Here's the second strategy, take your authority. When, when, when what Jesus did for us when he came to this earth and, and he rose from the grave, he defeated the devil, but he took back the authority that Adam's family lost. With all the thousands of years of havoc in the Old Testament, all that happened on the earth because they lost the authority of God. Jesus came to make God's family protected again. Our birthright as a believer is protection from the enemy. And Jesus said to believers, I give you authority over all the enemy's power and nothing shall harm you. So God has given us back our authority. Now we have protection within our birthright individually and in our family. God has given you authority over your family. You have to take it. God's authority is, 
it flows through your vessel, mom, dad, it comes. When we pray, that power upon everything that, that we're praying about, every person, every situation, then we allow the power of God to work through our powerlessness. Here's the third strategy, partner with God the Father. This is gonna make you happy. Accept the reality that marriage is the devil's number one enemy. He despises marriage. You need to know that if you're gonna have a successful marriage. In fact, the day you married, you went into covenant, you picked a fight with the devil. Why does he despise marriage so much? Get this, it's because of the image of God. God the Father intended to put his image on mankind. Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us, it's, it's called compound unity and oneness, let us make man. Man, men bear the image of God, but not the full image of God. I, I know you guys are disappointed in that. You, know, you thought you were the God of the house. You're not. You bear some of the image. Women bear the image of God, but not the full image of God. Marriage is the full image of God. Man is a type of Jesus Christ. The woman is a type of the Holy Spirit. And then when you partner with God the Father, you have these three pieces together, and now you, you have the, 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 the nature of Jesus in your marriage. You have the Holy Spirit's comfort and, and, and helper, being a helper in your marriage, and that's the plan for God's marriage on the earth. It's his image on the earth. So when Satan sees marriage, he sees the image of God. He hates it. Here's why. Under, the, the devil wants to conquer communities, our country, your home. The enemy's strategy is to wipe out the image of God in our homes. So we have to partner with God the Father. He designed us to be in a close personal relationship with him. He never designed us to be in defeat. He never designed us to be in lack. He intended for us to see victory and blessing and, and, and increase. So when the enemy sees a family that has this image, it reminds him of the rule of God and that this marriage is an extension of the rule of God, and that's why he hates your marriage. That's why he hates you being in unity, and you being in covenant, so that's why you need to partner with God. In fact, what we should declare, a declaration in a battle is more like a war cry, what we should declare is that we're gonna partner with God the Father. And when we partner with him, watch, he will shoulder the heaviness of the parenting burden. He will provide power, protection, wisdom, ability beyond ourselves. The wonderful insight in this is that we don't have to be tossed around by the storms of change. Did you hear me? We don't have to worry about the storms of change. We're partnering with him. Listen, our children's lives do not ever have to be left to chance. I heard my dad say this, and I've said this to my wife. Only God knows what our grandchildren will face. But what you have to understand is there's been a lot of generations fighting for my family. Like four generations of pastors and preachers. We're fighting for the family. So I can't look at the negative and I can't be overwhelmed with what I don't know. What I have to understand is I'm in partnership with God and he has a purpose and a plan for my children and their children and their children's children until he comes. And so now here's what I can start doing. I don't have to live in fear and I don't have to be a perfect parent. Because God the Father is the only perfect parent. And now, this moment, you can start making a positive difference in your children's future. Yeah, but they're already 18 years old, 20 years old. It doesn't matter, they're your kids forever. Believe me. <laughs> they're your kids forever. But it's the power of partnering with the Father. Here's the key. Listen to me, parents. The key is not trying to do it all in one day or a 21-day plan. The key is to turn to the one and only perfect parent, God the Father, Daily, daily. What am I gonna face today? What are my children gonna face today? How do I handle my marriage today? What are we gonna encounter today financially? Daily I turn to him because I'm gonna partner with him. So here are the strategies. You're gonna, you're gonna pray for your family, ask God to fight for you. You're gonna take your authority and you're gonna partner with the God the Father. So, so listen, there is a battle going on right now to keep you from fighting to finish the vision God has given your family to rise and build for generations to come. There is. But now you know you're in a battle. 
And you now you have a little insight to the battle, but what do you wear to the battle? Now what I'm gonna give you in this last part before I wrap up is, is, is simplistic, and most of you already know it. But some are not wearing, they're not dressed for battle. Paul writes this, Ephesians 6, 10, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that's the strategies, the plots, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Watch, your enemy's not flesh and blood. Your enemy's not that coworker. Your enemy's not that politician. Your enemy is not that person who lives down the street that doesn't like you. It's not flesh and blood, do you hear me? It's not flesh and blood. Well, then what is it? He's gonna tell us. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts in wicked pla heavenly places. So let's see what that is. Here, here's why we need to dress for battle, because of our enemies. Listen, this is not about people, not about flesh and blood. This is about a spirit that's been around since Satan was kicked out of heaven. This spirit, these four spirits still reside in our, in, in our world today. Here's the first one, principalities. It's a descriptive word of a prince that's appointed authority over a certain geographical area in the kingdom of darkness. Best example, you probably know it. In Daniel 10, the prophet's told his prayers have been answered. They've been heard, they've been answered. But the, the, the delay is the angel's been in a battle with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. The second enemy's powers. Powers represent demons who, have, who seek to have power over individual lives. Well, how do they do that? Two ways, through intrusion or an open door. So they encroach the lives of God's people through intrusions or open doors. Thirdly is the rulers of darkness of this world. They, listen to me, there are demons assigned to people in leadership to influence their decision for the kingdom of darkness. Did you hear me? It's not the person, it's the enemy that's influencing the person to make decisions about the kingdom of darkness. Number four, spiritual wickedness in high places. This is associated with religion. Don't make me go off on religion. Don't make me call religious leaders names that propagate trash and stuff because it is a religious spirit. So I gotta stop and we'll get in trouble. <laughs> what do we wear to fight then? Well, it starts in verse 13. Paul tells us, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand. Verse 14, stand therefore having girding your waist with the truth, put it on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So here's what we wear to battle. Stay with me, you know this, but stay with me. The belt of truth. Satan is the father of lies. When you tell a lie, you're acting like the father of lies. So if you don't know how to have truth, you can't defeat him. The Bible is the truth. You can't defeat him without the truth. You have gotta know the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. This protects us from the work of Satan as an accuser because he comes along and blames you, puts you under condemnation and guilt. But you see, it doesn't work because Christ is the one who is totally blameless. When I put on his righteousness, his accusations do not affect me. Here's the third one, the sandals. This isn't just to go out and preach the gospel, but this is for spiritual warfare. Paul's looking at a Roman soldier. Their sandals had spikes on the bottom, why? So when they're fighting on the hillside, they don't lose their footing and fall down and the enemy standing over them with a sword. These three that I just mentioned, watch, are positional truths. In other words, they come by virtue of being a Christian. Those three come by virtue of being a Christian. The next four pieces that Paul gives us are not positional. What does that mean? I have to do my part and put them on. I can't wait on the pastor, I can't wait on a preacher to preach the sermon, I can't wait on grandma's prayers, I have to take the responsibility to fight, to finish, and put these on. So let's go back to verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts, the arrows of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's look at those really quickly, the shield of faith. Faith is believing what God said. If you don't believe what God said, you're gonna have doubt against what God's word is. The helmet of salvation. Paul, when he writes, he's not worried about the enemy stealing our salvation, nor is he saying we can only hope we're saved. No, 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 he's saying the, hope, the, the helmet is the hope of deliverance. And the enemy wants you to believe the lie that your life situations are hopeless. 
what was done to you, what's being done to you, what has happened to you, that that's hopeless. God says, no, 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 you need to put on the helmet of salvation. Then there's the sword of the Spirit. He's referring to memorizing the Word of God. Listen to me. Because the Holy Spirit, Spirit can't bring to your mind what's not there. That's a sermon. Wow. Words are not magic. Notice this is the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword the Holy Spirit uses, not us. The power's in the truth of the Scripture. When we come against the enemy with the truth of God, he has to flee. No, no, and the last one's praying with supplication. Use target prayers. Choose verses to pray over the targets the enemy is aiming at. And when you pray for another person and you're being attacked, it puts you on the offensive. That's what God wants, the counterattack. But look back at verse 16. Put it back up. Above all, this is Paul. In other words, the most important part, so watch. He's saying, above all, take the shield of faith, which you can quench all the fiery arrows, darts of the enemy. Your shield of faith can quench the arrows of the enemy coming at you and your family. Paul's looking at this. Paul's been in a Roman prison. He's seeing Roman soldiers. He's, he, this is in his culture. He knows what he's talking about. He's not reading some outdated history book. He's seeing all this for the first time in his life. All of this is coming to him by revelation of the Holy Spirit. And so he knows that in the Roman army, the soldiers, there's two types of, of shields. And the first type is round and beautiful and shiny. And when people saw it, they, they were, it impressed them. They would see them, well, a soldier with that, it hooked to your loins. Remember Paul said the belt of truth is girded to your loins. That truth is the word of God. So your faith is hooked or connected to the word of God. Now the soldier in the natural did this, hooked this small shield to his side so his hands would be free to war in the natural. In the spiritual, we use our hands to freely worship. When you come into a corporate worship and you begin to worship God, it's this small round shield that you're using that people see it. It's a reflection. It's, it's beautiful. It's attractive. It's, it, 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 you see joy and peace in the presence of God. When you go to the house of God, this is the one you bring, and it encourages people. This is the place where you publicly display your faith, your testimony, your confection of mouth. But listen, this is not the shield used in battle. It's pretty. It looks good if you're marching in a parade. It looks good you come in to worship. This is not the shield you use in battle. The Roman soldier had a second type of shield. It was big enough for a man to stand behind. The root word in the Greek means a door. But when they went into battle, they had this option. They, they, they had this shield that they could use that completely protected them. But here's what they learned to do. They learned a strategy of warfare that when they would take soldiers side by side and connect the shields together at the top and the bottom, it formed like this wall of protection and then they could, they could fight together and defeat the enemies and this was their tactic. The, when the real battle comes, I need the second shield. I put it up not just to cover me, but I really want it with brothers and sisters in the Lord. I really want it for my family. I really want my family to know Jesus and to be my blood, and I want us to connect our faith together so when the enemy comes and attacks, just like they did in Nehemiah's day, then hey, th this is not your family, this is not, th you, you can't touch these, God's fighting for us, and we have this shield to deflect the, the darts and the arrows that he's going to shoot at us. But the word said, watch, it said, the shield of faith to quench the fiery dirt, darts arrows. The word quench does not mean that it keeps them from being shot or coming at you. In fact, the fiery dart literally means missiles. Missiles. Now, we, we've all played with darts, but I don't think anybody's played with missiles that's here. Romans used three types of missiles, arrows. It was a plain one, just an arrow. And it may not kill you, it depends on where it hits you, but it could wound you. Then they had a tar arrow. Wherever it hits, it, it would set it on fire, cause great pain from a burn. Worst type of pain is a, is a burn wound. And then there was the combustible. This is the most dangerous because no one knows if it's a fire uh, arrow or not until it hits the target. No one knows the extent of what it's gonna do until it hits the target. In today's terms, the enemy is shooting arrows at you and I. So that plain arrow could represent common testings every day. Every day, 
you know, you have good days, you have bad days, but there's common things in life that you're gonna fight. Those common things, we typically use our round shield to deflect or knock down. And then the tar arrow, this arrow tries to plant unclean thoughts in my head. And see, we go immediately, when we think unclean thoughts, we think of something pornographic, and that's true. But it also means unclean thoughts about my wife, my, my husband, or, or, or my family, my kids, my job, my government, even my church. These thoughts make my shield unclean, no reflection. I'm just blending in with everybody else. Nobody sees this reflection of a soldier. And then there's this combustible arrow, and, and, and these are the most dangerous because you, you don't see smoke or fire coming. It looks harmless, and you think, I, I can do this. I'll just get my little round shield and hold it up. And they would actually, they built these with a reed, with a point, and so when it would ignite, when it would hit, it would ignite with a handmade material they put inside and create a fire. So, so remember, the larger shield is to quench the arrows of tar and fire. Well, how did that happen? Well, these shields were six layers of animal skin, and they were pulled so tight it was almost like steel. But the Roman soldiers knew if they didn't take care of it, it would crack. And if an arrow of fire, a combustible arrow hits the shield and it's cracked, it's gonna catch on fire. Remember, this shield represents your faith. If your faith is dry and the arrows are shot at you, then you, you don't have a desire to pray. You don't have a desire to worship. You don't have a desire to read the word. You're going through the motions. Your faith is, is there. Then when the arrow comes and the problem comes, you don't have faith to rise up against the problem and agree with the word of God because you're dry. So what the soldiers would do, they, you know, they, they knew this, the cracks would come and the soldiers carried a little bottle of oil and daily soldiers took oil and rubbed down their shields. Daily represents anointing of God, daily partnering with the Father, daily in relationship with the Holy Spirit, daily asking God to anoint you with fresh oil, with fresh anointing. But when they went to battle, when they knew the enemy was there, when they'd been called out by the enemy and they had to go to the battlefield, here's what the soldiers would do. they take this big shield that's you know like four foot by six foot and they would put it in water. And you know what oil and water they don't mix in the natural, so when we pull it out, you got water beads all over it. And they would go and they would connect their shield of faith. Now, I'm gonna give you a picture of this, okay? So stay with me. I'm pretending you're children in children's church. The enemy's attacking. Not my home, and your, not just my home, but your home too. And his home and their home. So we get together and we connect our shields. And we've had fresh oil put on them. We put them in the water of the word. And when the enemy shoots those combustible, when he shoots, not if, but when he shoots those combustible arrows and they hit the target and they explode, there's a fire. But that shield, that, that arrow can't stay there because it's hit this oil. And it's gonna, it's gonna, the arrow's gonna kind of drip, drop. Then the soldiers would take their shields. I can just see it in my mind, all connected. See, there's 20 people, and when they get hit and attacked, they would take their shields and they would do like this, and they would shake it. And the water beads on that shield would put the fire out. And what the enemy meant to hurt would crumble to bits and pieces on the ground. And the Roman soldiers would win the war. I know that's simple. I know you've probably heard me share that before, but it is so powerful if you grasp how important corporate worship is and small groups and having people to be in relationship with in the body of Christ so that you're not warring alone. Nehemiah got all the families together. So the soldiers use strategy in the, in, in the battle. They learn that when the arrows would hit the oil, they would shake their shields, the water would quench the fire, the enemies would attack, but their attack would fall to the ground. To successfully fight to finish, we should learn what to wear to battle, but we need to learn to keep our shield oil and learn to shake it with the water of the word and the enemy's missile will fall. So here's my question for you. Don't raise your hand. Two generations from now, 
What are they going to say about your house? Well, it folded. It was destroyed. What are your grandchildren going to say about you? Are they going to know who God is because of you, mom and dad? Will the, will the second and third generation of believers, will they exist because of you? See, you, you, you have to quit blaming the culture and the society. You have, to, you have to take the responsibility to fight to finish for your house. And God is for you, and he loves families, and he remembers families. And he's gonna fight for you. You have to do your part. You have to take the shield of faith. You gotta keep it alive and active. I want us to be the righteous generation that gives righteousness to a thousand generations so their lives will be better. You wanna know something? You have a guarantee of success if you will fight to finish because God will fight for you. Uh, here's how I wanna finish this message at the campuses. I don't want you leaving the room. If you do, you're probably gonna get an arrow shot at you by the enemy <laughs> or somebody, just saying. But sometimes when we, when we hit this part, we, you know, we're gonna wrap up, close up, we're gonna pray a little prayer, and that's good, and that's great. But I don't feel like that fits today. I feel like today there's parents and grandparents that need to make a war cry. They need to make a declaration. Yeah, but my kids are already grown. They're still your kids. They still have your blood. They're gonna give you grandkids one day and great-grandkids. So I, well, here's what I want us to do as a church. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna sing this song together and it is a declaration that we're gonna fight to finish. I can tell you're so excited about it. <laughs> so I'm gonna put you on the spot. If you, don't, don't leave the room. I got archers. <laughs> if you wanna declare with us together as a body, I want you to stand up. Come on. Before they lead you in this song, and I want you to sing this song with everything you've got in you. This is a declaration, it's like a war cry. I want you to just to imagine that everybody you're standing by, you've just connected your shield by standing up. And as the army of God, as an army, we're gonna make a declaration. This is how we're gonna fight, and we're gonna fight till we finish, because God is with me, and he's gonna fight for me. Are you ready to do it? Are you ready? Let's do it. Sing it may look, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by, we believe it today. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded on every side. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm so singing. It may look like, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yes, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm, you never leave us. No, no, no. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. Like I
Thank you so much for watching and being a part of City Hope and Listen. Uh, if you feel like you need to take a step, maybe it's a decision to follow Jesus or, or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life, or maybe it's even just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. So right now, there's a QR code coming up on our screen follow the link and give us the opportunity to connect with you. Because if we know anything, it's that content alone is never gonna help you uh, find the life change that God has for you. So look, give us the opportunity to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you and help you grow and be a part of our church. But we love you, can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope.